Professor. Okay, well, let's get underway with the theme of the day, nonlinear control under uncertainty. So if we can just tee up um, the presentation. First up, we have Dr. Gaston Fermendois with his talk, Robust Adaptive Model-Based Compensator for the Benchmark Problem in Real-Time Hybrid Simulation. Okay, you. thank you. Yes, Whenever thank ready, you. Um, Dr. Fermandois, and I'll give you a, a, a bit of a, a gentle nudge in about 18 minutes just to, to let you know to, to uh, finish up. Sure, can, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, okay, perfect. Uh, thank you for the kind presentation, Andrew. Uh, my name is uh, Gaston Fermandois, and today I'm going to talk about uh, compensation, dynamic compensation on real-time uh, hybrid simulation tests. Um, I would like to start first uh, by telling me, telling you that I'm an assistant professor from Universidad Santa Maria in Santiago de Chile. Uh, I have a PhD from the University of Illinois, and my research interests are uh, basically focused on uh, experimental structural dynamics, uh, earthquake engineering, uh, and some other uh, aspects of those uh, uh, researchers. Uh, if you want more information, you can go to my website and I have a Twitter account also where I usually post uh, things related to, to academics. Um, I'd like to start my presentation first by acknowledging the work that I'm going to present today, which was basically uh, the master's thesis of one of my students called uh, Cristobal Galmes. So I would like to acknowledge all his work uh, and also acknowledge the the funding from uh, Fondesid uh, Iniciación Grant uh, number uh, 11190774, which uh, uh, gave us uh, the, the funding to, to conduct all these studies. Um, so uh, we are gathered today uh, and tomorrow to talk about hybrid simulation. Uh, and I'm the first uh, speaker, so I will briefly introduce what hybrid simulation is for uh, the, the new uh, uh, researchers in the field. Uh, basically, hybrid simulation is an experimental method for uh, uh, testing, structural testing. And in particular, is, a, is an alternative uh, for dynamic testing, an alternative to shaking table tests. This was uh, developed by Professor Nakashima uh, in 1992, um, where uh, the structure that we want to study is divided in two main components. One is the critical element that we want to test in the laboratory, and the rest of the structure is simulated numerically. The interaction between these two worlds, the cybernetical or uh, numerical uh, environment, and the physical and experimental is uh, interacted through uh, enforcing the uh, equations of motion and the governing equations through a series of actuators and sensors. The features are that uh, this uh, method is uh, very realistic and cost-effective compared to other methods, more traditional methods for experimental testing, such as shake table tests. And that's the reason why we're interested in, in uh, continue developing this method and try to push it forward uh, to, to improve our ways to uh, accurately assess the performance of uh, structural systems. Uh, there are some uh, uh, illustrations here where we show both domains, one that we're going to call the numerical uh, domain that is basically uh, a numerical model in our computer and the experimental substructure which consists on the loading equipment, the, the physical specimen that is connected and so on and so forth. How we enforce both compatibility and equilibrium at the boundary between these two domains through the use of actuators and sensors. But the challenge in real-time hybrid simulation is to do this in, in real time. Uh, we need to synchronize both domains uh, for a very small uh, time uh, of integration. And that is quite a challenge. Um, the other challenge that arises when we want to conduct a uh, real-time hybrid simulation is the fact that the uh, loading equipment actuators have its own intrinsic dynamics. And because of those dynamics, the, there is a delay between the command signal that we want to impose over our specimen and the measure signal from the specimen. 
This delay uh, can cause instability in the hybrid system when we are conducting the integration. And, and this could render first the, the test to be unreliable. The results that we're going to get from, from it are, are basically nonsense. And second of all, and more importantly, uh, we can damage not only the specimen pre, uh, prematurely, but also we can uh, induce damage into our experimental equipment. And that is very bad. Uh, so there are a lot of research in the field that try to uh, account for these dynamics and compensate them in order to avoid having uh, instability problems and try to get the best data possible from the laboratory. We do that using uh, control techniques uh, and we can classify control techniques uh, in, in two ways. This is my classification. We can discuss this maybe uh, later on. Uh, one is controllers that have fixed gains. Uh, usually these controllers require accurate models of what we want to control. Uh, and the problem is if there is uncertainty in uh, one part of this uh, hybrid system, uh, this could deteriorate the performance of our test. Uh, the second uh, type of controller are uh, grouped in what we call adaptive controller. The adaptive controller are less dependent on the model. The adaptation can improve performance but it is not necessarily independent of the model. And I'm going to, to show a couple of examples later on. Um, adaptation, uh, adaptive compensation techniques have been uh, developed uh, in the uh, literature and are present in the literature. Uh, and it's a, it's a long list of uh, research uh, in the field and this is a set of some of the more important studies on the topic. Uh, we have first RTHS tests conducted in the uh, uh, United Kingdom by Professor Wallace in 2005, where they um, propose an adaptive polynomial extrapolation compensate, compensator. Uh, now the, the most famous uh, adaptive compensation technique used these days is the adaptive time series. Uh, developed in, in Professor uh, Rico's group. Uh, we have uh, recent contributions like the backstep in adaptive control from OEN, uh, the conditional adaptive time series from Palacio and Gutierrez, et cetera, et cetera. The issue from uh, this uh, group of adaptive compensation techniques is that they're usually designed and calibrated based on prior knowledge of the control plan, which includes the specimen because there is an interaction between the loading equipment and the specimen, what we usually call control structure interaction. So due to control structure interaction, a specific compensator is usually designed for a particular experiment. So if you want to study uh, a building, building A, we need to tune all these games and then we run the test. If we now want to study building B, we need to do it all over again, which is quite cumbersome and time consuming. Uh, and sometimes it's not a very rational way to try to calibrate these, these gains. So the question that arises is, is it possible to design one adaptive compensator for a set of uncertain substructure with relevant, uh, uh, guaranteed robustness? Uh, so this is the question that drives our, our research. Uh, the study objectives uh, are as follows. First, design an adaptive compensator without prior knowledge of the structural properties of physical specimens that are going to be tested. Uh, second, con the control design does not require modeling of the physical specimen to avoid premature damage. And that is something that we also want to try to avoid. Uh, damage the, the specimen even before doing the, the real test just to get a, an accurate model. We, we don't need an accurate model for adaptive uh, compensation. Third, try to get a, a, a compensation scheme that is capable of uh, synchronizing tests for different subtracting scenarios. And finally, uh, look for the potential of scalability of this uh, proposed methodology for more complex multi-actual loading uh, scenarios. So uh, let's talk about dynamic compensation. Uh, there, there is uh, one field of dynamic compensation uh, fixed gain con controllers, which is called model-based compensation. 
Model-based compensation is excellent uh, for delay compensation for deterministic plants without disturbances. Basically, if you know uh, what you want to, to test and control, uh, there's no other way uh, to, to get uh, better results than using model-based compensation. But it requires a control plant uh, model to, to develop all these uh, uh, designs and get the, 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 the right performance uh, that, that we want. Um, an alternative, as I mentioned before, is compensation. We don't need an accurate model, right? Uh, we can uh, tune these uh, parameters uh, in real time and update these parameters in real time to capture all the uh, unmodeled dynamics from your controller and uncertainty that could appear in the simulation, for instance, sensor noise or uh, other kinds of disturbances. Uh, the problem is uh, related to robustness, uh, and there are several studies, especially in the fields of uh, electrical engineering and mechanical engineering, where uh, the conventional adaptive schemes that we are currently using in RTHS uh, are uh, suffer from instability in the presence of disturbances. Uh, so if, if we got... Uh, an adaptive controller that was designed for nominal uh, uh, properties without the, uh, any disturbances, it's going to work quite well. Uh, but when we start adding sensor noise, et cetera, uh, the, the stability is going to degrade and at some points we will have an unstable uh, response. So this is something that we need to, to consider when we design these controllers. Uh, so the adaptive load must be carefully calibrated for uh, getting the performance and the robustness that we want. Um, starting from model-based compensation, we usually get a, a linearized model of our control plan. Our control plan usually is uh, the servo hydraulic actuator connected to a physical specimen, and we incorporate into our model what we called control structure interaction, the interaction between the specimen and the actuator. Um, and usually uh, we approximate this, this model, uh, this physical model with a third order transfer system without serials. So uh, a, a very simple linearized model of our uh, loading equipment with a specimen uh, attached could be, for instance, this transfer function. Uh, the the model-based compensation for RTHS uh, is based on a feedforward controller that is the inverse of the plan that we uh, want to uh, synchronize. Synchronize. Uh, the idea being is that if we have this feedforward controller connected to the control plan in series, we will get an open loop system with unity gain and zero phase. Um, and the controller can be implemented using finite differences uh, to approximate the higher order derivatives of the target signal. And it, it can be shown like in the equation here that this is uh, a, a typical controller that we will develop for uh, RTHS using the model-based compensation approach. The question is, uh, how do we get these uh, uh, parameters AI from zero to three? So instead of uh, fixing those parameters AI, we use adaptive uh, model-based compensation. And uh, we are uh, using uh, the framework uh, proposed by uh, Beijing Cheng uh, et al. Uh, from his uh, article in 2015, where we choose parameters AI, adaptive parameters AI, and uh, those parameters are identified with a preliminary test. Uh, and this, in, in the original paper from Beijing Chen, uh, this incorporated a uh, control structure interaction. Uh, the, adaptive, the adaptive parameters are updated at each time step using an adaptive law that is shown uh, in, let me see if I can uh, use my, uh, pointer. Okay. This adaptive law over here, uh, which is based on something that we call gamma, which is the adaptive gain. 
And the adaptive gain is basically a, a, a number, a parameter of how fast the adaptation of these adaptive parameters is going to be uh, permitted, right? Uh, and this adaptation will be proportional to the estimation error and the uh, adaptive gain matrix. This is a matrix. So originally, uh, the adaptive model-based compensation approach, uh, the, the design incorporates uh, designing the initial control parameters A and propose an adaptive gain matrix gamma. Uh, the initial conditions usually are obtained from a model of the control plan considering specimen interaction, but doing so will have a risk of uh, prematurely damage the specimen, which is something that we don't want. So is it possible to, to avoid that uh, using a, a new approach? And second of all, we need to decide what value of gamma will be used to control the rate of adaptation of our parameters A. If we choose a very small value of gamma, this will result in slow adaptation. And therefore, this can lead to uncompensated delays. So basically, the compensator is not working. Uh, on the other hand, if we choose very high values of gamma, it is uh, certain that the uh, parameters are going to diverge and this could lead to unstable adaptation. And the question that arises is, where do we find our best value of uh, adaptive gains gamma? That is something that we call gamma asterisk or gamma optimal. So what we propose is the following. Uh, conduct a robust calibration, a robust tuning of the adaptive controller using offline simulations before the test. Uh, the robust calibration only requires prior knowledge of the actuator without specimen. Yeah. So there's no need to, to attach the specimen and conduct system identification with the specimen attached. We, we can have our uh, actuators, uh, bare actuators. We can conduct all the tests that we want in actuators. That is knowledge that we have uh, at our hands and we can design uh, our controllers using that information. Given a certain value of gamma, uh, the adaptive gain, we conduct offline simulations, uh, a certain number uh, up to uh, uh, N uh, simulations uh, with different target displacements, different random uh, virtual control plans. We can uh, parameterize all those uh, 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 systems in order to introduce uncertainty into the uh, calibration approach. And finally, we calculate a performance indicator, which is called in this case R2. R2 is the sample mean of uh, indicators J2 that were previously uh, proposed in the benchmark RTHS uh, problem. I'm going to introduce what J2 is in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, and we choose the best value of uh, adaptive gain gamma, which will minimize this performance indicator R2. Uh, this is conducted, as I said before, offline. And when we obtain the best value of gamma, then we are ready to uh, start the, the test in the, in the laboratory. Uh, this is uh, 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 a study that we, we wrote a, a manuscript and has already been submitted uh, for publication. Uh, we're at the two minute mark. Um, so uh, the, the numerical application uh, to, to validate this, we use the, the benchmark problem, uh, the benchmark problem developed by uh, Professor Dyke's group. Uh, and we modified it uh, a little bit. So this problem, uh, considers a three-story frame uh, with a single degree of freedom experimental substructure. Uh, the servo hydraulic actuator model includes specimen interaction and parameter uncertainty. Uh, the original benchmark considered four partition cases and different ground motions, starting from El Centro 1940, Kobe 1995, and Maule 2010. Additional configuration for this study uh, are proposed. Uh, the first four are the original cases from the benchmark problem with the same experimental substructure. Meanwhile, the fifth and sixth uh, case are additional uh, cases 
that incorporate randomness in the experimental substructure. Uh, we consider for calibration purposes, a number of 100 simulations for each uh, um, step into the optimization scheme. Uh, the model of the actuator without specimen interaction, uh, we consider those values to uh, design our adaptive parameters A, which I call A initial. And this is the initial values of the adaptive parameters, not the adaptive gains. Uh, in this figure, I can show you in red the initial model. Uh, basically, this is the actuator, bare actuator without specimen connected. And the blue curve is uh, the uh, actuator with, spec with uh, specimen interaction. You can see that there are some significant differences between the red and blue curve when we connect a specimen, especially in the, in the time delays. Time delays for low frequencies, uh, we got a, a severe increment on the time delays when we attach a specimen to the equator. Uh, in gray, I uh, illustrate uh, different virtual plants uh, that were considered through uh, uh, uncertain parameters that were included into our uh, framework. Um, there is a, a filter, a low pass filter that was incorporated in the adaptation uh, scheme. Uh, we use a Butterworth uh, filter with a cutoff frequency of around 20 Hertz. So basically our uh, adaptive controller will behave well in that range and, and basically is going to reject a, a, any noise that comes from high uh, order uh, frequency content uh, vibrations. Uh, and you can see from, from this figure that if we choose uh, our adaptive compensator to start with the information of the initial model in red, uh, and the real control plan is the one that is uh, shown in blue, uh, we need to compensate to get from red to blue uh, from one point to another. Um, so I will illustrate uh, the JAVE offline simulation into this optimization uh, problem. Uh, we, as an input, we got the adaptive gains, gamma K. We select the earthquake of interest and a random uh, SDOF structure for calibration purposes. Uh, we initialize the adaptive compensator with our adaptive parameters A and the chosen value of gamma K for this simulation. Uh, we uh, randomize also the, the control plants uh, and we add sensor noise to in, in, in incorporate also that disturbance into the mix. And finally, we get the responses and we calculate the J2 uh, uh, function, which is basically the normalized random mean square error between the target uh, displacements and the measured displacements. Uh, that's for each uh, simulation. And finally, when we conduct all J simulations from, from one to 10, uh, we calculate the sample mean of this uh, indicator and that's called R2. Uh, and then we uh, incorporate this R2 into our optimization framework and we minimize the R2s and we obtain the desired uh, adaptive gain gamma. So uh, I'm going to show you the results of sensitivity analysis. So we have four uh, adaptive parameters, A0 to A3. Our adaptive gain matrix, gamma, we chose it uh, as a diagonal matrix, and we focus only on the values on the di diagonal, mainly gamma 0 to gamma 3. As you can see from this figure, if we graph the R2 objective function, uh, with respect to all different values of uh, gains, we can see that, uh, well, here one point means that we conducted 100 simulations for each random parameter. We have a match of 200 points with random combinations for gamma y, uh, gamma i using uh, um, Latin hypercube sampling uh, to improve uh, the, the speed of all these calculations. Uh, and gamma one controls the adaptation of A1 uh, 
which is the parameter which majorly influence the delay compensation. So this is basically something that we learned. Uh, gamma one is the, the most important adaptive gain uh, from the, the set of adaptive gains that we're trying to uh, optimize. Second thing is uh, if we look at the design space, uh, we, we're dealing with a multidimensional design space. So we, we had to uh, make uh, some cuts on, the, on this multidimensional design space to, to get a, a sense of how these uh, values of uh, gains gamma will uh, get you a different value of R2. And uh, we can see from here, uh, the blue colors are the, the, the cases where we have the lowest value of uh, the objective indicator. And uh, orange is, uh, sorry, uh, yellow is basically the infeasible region. Um, um, Dr. Wendua, uh, we're going to have to wrap up soon. Um, if if sure. you just do a few more slides, uh, I just want to be respectful of everyone's time and make sure that we have time for the other presentation. Yes, of, of course, of course. I have uh, two more slides. So I, I, I want to just uh, stress here that uh, when we use our optimization uh, scheme, uh, for instance, we use global optimization with particle swarm, we get the uh, red uh, crosses uh, and that show us the optimal value of gamma. Um, meanwhile, uh, if we have a look, uh, for instance, the yellow zone is the infeasible region where we have instability. Uh, the uh, Calypso or cyan uh, values are slow adaptation, but we have stable results. And other values of, uh, that are close to the optimal, which we call suboptimal, can be chosen to improve robustness. So as long as we are far from this boundary, which is the yellow boundary, we are safe. We're not going to have instability. We can have worse uh, performance compared to the optimal case, but still we're going to have uh, good results. So uh, since I don't have much time, uh, this figure of a real uh, RTHS test, a virtual RTHS test, uh, after we calibrated all our gains, and you can see here that uh, from parameters A0 to A3, uh, when the simulation starts, we'll have fast adaptation at the beginning of the strong motion, and then we will converge to the values that were identified for the uh, case when we consider control structure interaction. And uh, the, the red curve, which is the initial model, will uh, go to the blue curve, sorry, to the uh, green curve, which is basically the uh, control plant, but in the region of the uh, cutoff uh, frequency of the low pass filter that we incorporated inside the adaptive controller. Uh, since I don't have much time, uh, probably this is also something uh, quite important to, to show. Uh, we test also this result with different partitionings, different earthquakes and different experimental substructures. We conducted multiple uh, Monte Carlo simulations to, to incorporate the uncertainty for one compensator design with uh, our optimal uh, adaptive gains for this uh, broad uh, series of experiments. And you can see from these uh, figures on the left, on the right, uh, we uh, guaranteed the robustness for all these scenarios uh, with very good results. Um, and we, we have also good results for nonlinear specimens. So uh, nonlinear specimens can be considered as uh, unmodeled dynamics. So the same uh, compensator uh, uh, that was previously calibrated offline, uh, we got extremely good results for the nonlinear case uh, as well, with excellent tracking uh, J2 uh, performance in this less than uh, 3%. Uh, so in conclusion, adaptive control can be implemented to improve model-based uh, compensation. The initial compensator is designed independent from actua uh, actual actuator specimen interaction. The adaptive gains are calibrated to achieve robustness and performance under high uncertainty over control plants and numerical substru substructure. And excellent results are shown in BRTHS with uncertain linear and nonlinear systems. 
What is missing in the future is, uh, and what we are going to work in the future, is experimental validation for, for this uh, proposed uh, work. And uh, we are going to scale it up uh, using multiple uh, actuators. Uh, the challenge is uh, the interaction between uh, actuator and space and multiple actuators. And uh, the, the main focus here is try to scale it up with uh, compensators that are simple to manipulate because when we go to multi multi actual RTHS, we will have to deal with so many parameters that probably the problem is going to be untractable if we use uh, uh, nonlinear control and, and uh, so so forth. So with that, thank you again for your attention. I will be glad to answer any questions. I'm sorry for the the time. Thanks. Okay, um, we're just going, I think in the interest of getting to uh, the discussion sessions, we're going to move straight on to our next speaker. Um, if you do have questions, um, please write them down and, and make sure, um, hopefully we will have time for questions maybe at the end of the day, but um, my hope is that we can move